Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to the Command Valley. We've got a super exciting episode for you today. We're gonna to be talking about our favorite cards in Commander and super exciting because we have all four of us in the podcast here on the episode today. So super exciting. Uh, before we get into it, just a reminder that this show is brought to you by Game Grid Lehigh. If you're in the area, please check them out. They have amazing staff, an amazing card selection, deck boxes, deck sleeves, D&D gear, and tons of other board games. So we really appreciate them and give them a big shout out. Also, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe and give this video a like and comment down below on what your favorite cards in Commander are and why they're your favorite cards. We would love to hear from you guys. Like Griffin said, today we are going to be talking about our favorite cards in Commander. We've broken it down by the our favorite cards from each of the five colors, one multicolor card, our favorite artifact, our favorite commander, our favorite art, and our favorite land. Just a quick reminder that these cards are our personal favorites. We do not say that they are the best cards in the colors. We do not say that they are the most powerful or the ones that you need to play. Just simply our personal favorites, whether they be flavorful, have some good memories tied to them, or ones that we use often. It's very subjective. It could be even as subjective as this card has won me a couple of games or I just felt really good this one time that I played this card, it was super cool. Just kind of like how Griffin said, it's very sentimental, very subjective, and this does not reflect anything about the power level of any of these cards. Also, some of these cards may not even have to do with Commander. For example, I've got a couple cards here that I just remember playing in Standard and had a lot of fun with them and also run them in my cube. So uh, with that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. So kicking us off with white, I'll go first. My favorite card in white is Path to Exile. One white, instant, exile target creature. Its controller may search his or her library for a basic land card, put that card onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle his or her library. I know that's kind of lame. Like we said, it's literally just cards that we really like. I don't think it's lame. You don't think it's lame, Path no, to Exile? it's sweet. I think one white mana at instant speed to exile anything, super great. I mean, there is that little downside of your opponent gets a basic land, but like... Being able to permanently deal with a card maybe your opponent is playing a graveyard synergistic deck, they will never get that creature back. I think that's super cool. All right, this is Caleb, and my favorite white card is Elspeth Knight Errant. So she's a planeswalker, and she costs two generic and two white, and she's got a, she comes out with four loyalty, and her first plus one is put a 1-1 one, one white soldier token into play. Her second plus one, which is interesting, she's got two plus one abilities. Target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. And then her ult is a minus eight that says, for the rest of the game, artifacts, creatures, enchantments, and lands you control are indestructible. <clears throat> so Elspeth is one of those cards that is more of... One of my favorite cards because of the memories that I have tied to it. Uh, she was the very first Planeswalker I ever opened in a draft and the very first Planeswalker I ever owned. And back then, in the old days of Alara, she was a pretty insane Planeswalker. Just the fact that she has two plus one abilities. I don't think any other Planeswalker had two plus abilities at the time. And I was just ecstatic to be able to open her and to be able to play her in my draft. And then I remember actually getting my, I was so bad at magic back then too. I got a pity pack at the end of the night because I lost all of my games. Uh, but my my rare in my pity pack was the Ajani from the same set. So I got two Planeswalkers that same night and I was just this super magic noob and I was so excited to be able to open two Planeswalkers. Back then it was super magical to open a Planeswalker in a pack. It's not like War of the Spark where you could open up a Planeswalker in every single pack, you know? Griffin here. My favorite white card is Grand Abolisher. For two white, we have a 2-2 creature human cleric with during your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifact creatures or enchantments. Uh, so just to back up, the reason why I chose this card and a lot of the other cards that I picked as my favorites were cards that no matter when I had them, they always did something for me and I was always happy to have them. In, in the white decks that I play, Grand Abolisher is the sweetest thing that I can play on turn two or play later in the game. Stopping my opponents from interacting during my turn makes me feel safer and it is just a good feeling to have this card out on the battlefield. That's a mean card, Griffin. No, it's not. Oh, it's not? All right, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Peter here, speaking of mean cards and stacks, uh, my favorite white card is Smothering Tithe. It's uh, an enchantment for three and a white. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with 
tap it, sacrifice it, add one mana of any color. Uh, when this card came out, obviously all the commander players were screaming for it because it's ramp in white that's actually pretty good. I'm pretty conservative with my deck building. This is the only card that I put into every single one of my white decks. It's good in any strategy where you're playing against at least one opponent. It's, I mean, it's even good in standard, so I, I'm, I'm, I just love this card. All right, moving on to blue. This is Landon here, starting us off with my favorite card. And it's got to be Thassa's Oracle, a very recent card that has been added to the long list of blue combo cards. So Thassa's Oracle costs blue blue for a Merfolk Wizard. When Thassa's Oracle enters a battlefield, look at the top X cards of your library where X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them on top of your library and the rest on bottom of your library in a random order. If X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. Ding. So I put this card in every single deck that runs blue and I basically only play decks that have blue in them. So I play a lot of Thassa's Oracles. Even if I'm not trying to, you know, win the game by milling my entire library, Thassa's Oracle is still really great card selection and kind of like card advantage. Being able to look at, you know, even two cards and putting one on top and one on bottom, I mean, that's basically a sleight of hand. But the more that your devotion grows, the more cards, the, the deeper you can dig into your library. It's super good early game, it's super good late game. I'm always happy to draw Thassa's Oracle. And it's also one of the reasons why one of my favorite cards in black is my favorite card in black, and you'll hear my thoughts on that later. But yeah, Thassa's Oracle is my favorite card in blue. All right, my favorite card in blue. I actually had a really hard time coming up with my favorite card in blue, and I just thought, okay, what do I like to do in blue? In blue, I like to steal people's stuff, and I also like to do it for as cheap as possible. And the best way to do that is to play a super expensive card called Treachery. Um, I only have one of these, and I used to run it in my Narset deck. Peter can testify to how annoying that deck used to be. Yes. I have since deconstructed that deck because people did not have very much fun playing against it. Treachery is an enchant creature spell for three and two blue that says when it comes into play, you untap five lands, and then you enchant a creature and you control that enchanted creature. And so with, I just remembered playing this in Narset and being so mean with it because I would get it off the top of my deck and then I would tap five of my lands, add five to my mana pool, untap my lands by playing Treachery and then all of a sudden have access to 10 or more mana and I also got to steal somebody's creature for free. It's just all around one of the meanest blue cards that I could think of and I had a lot of fun playing it. It's now in my cube, but it's super fun. Okay, so my favorite blue card, which I actually switched right before I began because I just remembered a card that I always have fun playing and it is Mind's Dilation. It is five blue blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts his or her first spell each turn, that player exiles the top card of his or her library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. <laughs> I played this card so much in Yannette. Casting this off the top of my library and just letting my opponents just look at it and just stressing out about what the top card of their library would be for me to get. Might as well just scoop right after that, right? <laughs> it is so fun. I've got some amazing things off of it. It's, it's just so chaotic and so fun to play. And yeah, it's, it's definitely got to be my favorite blue card. Okay, and then uh, to round us off here, my favorite blue card it has to be Swan Song. Uh, for one blue, it's an instant counter target, instant enchantment or sorcery spell. It's a controller creates a 2 2 blue bird token with fly in. Uh, super cheap blue spell, slots really well into a lot of blue decks. Um, and it's probably the, the one counter spell that I play the most often. And I mean, a 2-2 two -two bird on the other side of the field doesn't feel too bad to go up against afterwards. So really like Swan Song, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Would. All right, next up we have the black cards. And like I said, with my Thassa's Oracle, Thassa's Oracle is the reason why this is my favorite card and that is Demonic Consultation. Cause I am a filthy CDH player. <laughs> Not um, filthy. Not filthy. I, I shower. So, Demonic Consultation. For one black, you get an instant that says, Name a card. Remove the top six cards of your library from the game and reveal the next card to all players. If it's the card named, put it into your hand. If not, remove that card from the game and continue revealing the top card of your library and removing it from the game until the named card appears. 
So basically how this card works is if you have Thassa's Oracle in your hand and you have this card in your hand, you cast Thassa's Oracle, trigger goes on the stack, you hold priority, you cast Demonic Consultation. You then name a card that is not in your library. And because of the way Demonic Consultation is worded, you will exile your entire library. After that resolves and your library is empty, Thassa's Oracle resolve, resulting in you winning the game. What? I, it's just, it's won me a lot of games. I love playing it. I love trying to come up with like the wackiest things to name that aren't in my deck. <laughs> Sometimes I like to name my opponent's commander. Oh my god! Because there's no way that can be in my deck. <laughs> and this one time I almost panicked and named a card in my deck. Sometimes you just get really oh. stressed out, you know? <laughs> there that are some... Bad. And I also like Demonic Consultation because if I am if I have my favorite commander, Kess, on the battlefield, and I cast Demonic Consultation, I can name the Thassa's Oracle, and Demonic Consultation will find me the Thassa's Oracle, and then Kess will let me cast Demonic Consultation from my graveyard. However, what will happen sometimes is I will cast Demonic Consultation and name Thassa's Oracle, and Thassa's Oracle will be in the top six cards, and then I will exile my entire library, my Thassa's Oracle will be gone, and then I lose the game on the next turn. It's so wild. It's awesome. It's just, you know, <laughs> super fun card. My favorite card in black, everybody. That is crazy. All right, so my favorite card in black, again, I had a really hard time picking because my favorite, first I should say that my favorite strategy in black is reanimating. I am a necromancer through and through. And so what better card to choose than reanimate? Uh, reanimate is a sorcery for one black that says put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control you lose life equal to its converted mana cost so when playing commander uh losing life equal to that creature's converted mana cost usually isn't a super big deal and so this becomes a really cheap way to bring back the meanest of the mean creatures that you can possibly usually cheat into your graveyard i think one of my favorite plays i ever did with reanimate this wasn't in commander this was again playing my cube um i was on the draw i had grizzle brand in my hand and reanimate in my hand and since i was on the draw the turn was passed to me i drew did nothing discarded grizzle brand they went and they were like oh great my opponent went and they were like oh great and then on my turn two, I reanimated Grizzlebrand and wrecked face. So um, I just love reanimation. And again, there's no better card in reanimate than reanimate. So my favorite card in black, it's actually two cards. And Cheater. I cannot talk about one of these cards without talking about the other. It is Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood. Sanguine Bond is three black black for an enchantment. Whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. And Exquisite Blood is four and a black for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent loses life, you gain that much life. So it is just the infinite drain of everybody's life until they are dead. And the reason why this is my favorite, because if anybody knows me, I don't normally play combos. However, this was the first combo that I was introduced to in Magic. I had one of my friends that had a, a life gaining deck that had both of these cards and it blew my mind when he played these two cards and I just immediately lost. I had to wrap my head around it and still to this day, I love these two cards and I love casting them both. I normally never get to, but I, I, I love these cards. My favorite card in black has to be Dictate of Erebos. Oh. If only for our most recent gameplay, the game where I flashed in Dictate of Erebus at the end of Caleb's turn and... Wrecked face. Wrecked face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make plain mistakes, guys. Uh, Dictate of Erebus is uh, an enchantment for three and two black. It's an enchantment with flash. Whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. Very simple. Very, very good in decks where you're killing your own creatures. Um, like like my Taysa deck or like Marin. Or, I, I will always remember that fateful play uh, where everything died... At the, end of, at the end of Caleb's turn, and uh, it was all thanks to this card <laughs> going off, so very grateful for Dictate of Erebus. I will always remember it as well. Thank you, Peter. Moving on to red, my favorite card is Young Pyromancer. It is a creature human shaman that costs one and a red, and it reads, Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a 1-1 one, one red elemental creature token, and it's a 2-1. This is a very innocuous card, and it seems like it doesn't really do much, but in all of the spell slinging that I've done, I have made a lot of 1-1 red elemental creature tokens. And it's really not anything amazing, but I just, I love having this card on the ba on the battlefield, and since I play a lot of spell slinging decks and I don't put a lot of creatures in them, being able to turn my spell slinging, my instants and sorceries into creatures is super helpful, and Young Pyromancer has kept me alive in a lot of games where I should have otherwise died. 
All right, my favorite red card is Monastery Swift Spear. It is a creature human monk for one red. She's a one, two with haste and prowess. And prowess is whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. So back when Monastery Swift Spear was in standard, I played the crap out of this card and I absolutely loved um, playing mono red with this because you can play her on turn one and swing with her. And then on turn two, when you've got access to a little bit more mana, your opponent is super unsure with her on the other side of the battlefield because she can swing in and they don't know what to expect because of the prowess. Or you could just lightning strike their creature and swing in for two with Monastery Swift Spear anyway. It was just a super fun card to play. I have my entire playset signed by Steve Argyle, so I, I treasure that card and the memories of just wrecking face with my mono red deck back then. So my favorite red card, and this is this is pretty recent, and I think it will be my favorite red card for a very long time. It is Fires of Invention. It is three red for an enchantment. You can cast spells only during your turn, and you can cast no more than two spells each turn. You may cast spells with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of lands you control without paying their mana cost. This card is scary. The things that you can do and abuse with Fire Intervention, just the possibilities are endless. The fact that you can still cast spells with your mana, but you don't have to, is sorely misunderestimated. In my Perforous Bronze Blooded deck, this card is one of the best cards to have because I can use Perforous's ability with my mana and still be able to cast two more spells with Fires of Invention. Super scary card and I just can't get enough of it. Probably going in every red deck that I play. All right, and my favorite red card is Perforos, God of the Forge. Um, Perforos is a three and a red legendary enchantment creature god. It's a six, five indestructible. As long as your devotion is less than five, Perforos isn't a creature. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Perforos deals two damage to each opponent and you can pay two and a red. Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Uh, I haven't actually had a lot of chances to play Perforos, but every time that I have, it's been a panic attack. <laughs> from everyone else trying to deal with this Perforos because there are so many creatures coming out on the battlefield and it's hurting a lot. I feel like there's so much value on this card um, and I mean it shows because it's it's a valuable card so uh, really like Perforos. Closing out the mono color we have green and my favorite green card is Arachnogenesis. It's an instant that costs two and a green and it says Put X, one, two green spider creature tokens with reach onto the battlefield, where X is the number of creatures attacking you. Prevent all combat damage that would be, that would be dealt this turn by non-spider creatures. So this is basically a fog on spider steroids. Your opponent gets his big old massive army, swings in at you thinking he's going to kill you, and you turn the tables, make a bunch of spiders, and nerf the entire combat step. And this is probably the best card in my Corvold Fake Cursed King deck. And it gives me so many things to sacrifice and draw all the cards. It's just such a good, good, good card. I love it. I would, I would play it in more green decks if it wasn't so expensive. It is like a $17 card. So, but yeah, if you can play Arachnogenesis, you should. All right. My favorite green card is a card that I have talked about a lot already on this podcast, and it is Guardian Project. For three generic and one green, you get an enchantment that says... Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, draw a card. So pretty much every time that you get a non-token creature card, since we're playing EDH, you're going to be able to draw a card with Guardian Project. I run this in a lot of decks that uh, cheat creatures back into play, like Marin and Mael, and also with Joda, I'm constantly just throwing stuff in um, at flash speed with other cards, and so I, I just love Guardian Project for the fact that every single time I play a creature, I'm refueling my hand, getting more stuff to play, and I've been super happy to draw Guardian Project every time that I have. So my favorite green card is kind of going to piggyback off of Caleb's here. It is Beast Whisper. He is two green green for a two three creature elf druid. Whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. Just another very simple green card that just is an engine all on its own. Any deck 
where you're playing green and you want to play a lot of creatures, having Beast Whisperer in your hand on the battlefield is a really, really good feeling. It is just such an engine. It can draw you just a bunch more cards. The more you keep casting creatures and it, it's simple, but so good. All right. And my favorite green card is a pretty good card. It's greater good. Ah. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's two and two green. Uh, it's an enchantment. It says sacrifice a creature. Draw cards equal to the sacrifice creature's power. Then discard three cards. Uh, favorite deck to play this in is my Uro deck. Uh, sacrificing Uro and getting six cards, discarding three to fuel Uro's strategy. Feels really, really good. And I, I really enjoy having this on the battlefield. And, and also, I just, I'm, I'm a fan of the Aristocrats strategy. I love sack outlets. So having this with, um, w with a green Aristocrat strategy as well is something that excites me as well. So favorite green card, greater good. It's pretty good. Pretty good. All right, moving on to the multicolored cards. We're just going to be doing one a piece. And mine is Thousand Year Storm. It's an enchantment that costs four, a blue and a red. And it says... Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy it for each other instant and sorcery spell you've cast before it this turn. You may choose new targets for the copies. So essentially this gives all of your instants and sorcery storm. And if this enchantment resolves and you get to untap with it, I mean, you're probably just going to win the game. I, I love smacking this card down on the table and just watching it turn into a 3v1. <laughs> Although not really because then I can't play with a thousand year storm, but like... If I can slap it down and protect it, that's I'm usually having a pretty fun time. One of my favorite interactions with Thousand Year Storm is uh, there's a card called Spell Twine. It's a sorcery that costs five and a blue, and you target an instant or sorcery in your graveyard and an instant or sorcery from an opponent's graveyard. You copy them, exile the originals, and you cast the copies. So that also increases your storm count. And if you've like casted a cantrip or like some instant or sorcery before you cast the spell twine and you get multiple copies of spell twine, it is exponentially going to grow your storm count and you can do so many cool things. Um, I really love the spell slinger strategy, as I said when I was talking about my favorite red card. And this is the spell slinger card dream. So Thousand Year Storm is my favorite multicolored card. All right, my favorite multicolored card is also one of my favorite commanders. It is Joda. Archmage Eternal. For one generic, one blue, one red, and one white, he's a 4-3 flyer that also has the ability that says you may pay Wooburg rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. So in other words, all of your huge Eldrazi spells now cost Wooburg. All of your spells like Expropriate and Omniscience, they cost Wooburg. Um, I just love that with Joda, I can play literally whatever I want in his deck. And for me, that was the reason why I chose him as my favorite multicolored card, because he lets me, like I said, he lets me play every single card and any card that I want to. And for only five mana. Do you ever cast Soul Ring for five mana? I do not cast Soul Ring for five mana, though. You should. So at least you can I've been you tempted. <laughs> I've been tempted. It's like a power move, right? <laughs> yeah. Think about it. You cast it for five, and then you can tap it for two. It's right so after. efficient! Only three mana? It's so good. Yeah. That's crazy. It's so good. I bet that goes infinite. It might. <laughs> it's if close. you try hard enough. <laughs> if you really believe. So my favorite multicolored card is actually not one that I play a lot in Commander, but it is the epitome of everything I want to do in Magic, and that is Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. Teferi is three white blue for a four loyalty planeswalker. His plus one draw a card at the beginning of the next end step, untap two lands. Minus three put target non-land permanent into its owner's library, third from the top. And minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever you draw a card, exile target permanent and opponent controls. So yeah, like I said, even though I, I don't play Teferi in Commander that much, because again, you're playing against three other people and planeswalkers are just hard to have stick around, especially this guy. His three abilities... And his control vibe is probably the probably the card that would be my personality card. If any of you want to know how I like to play Commander, just look at Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, and you'll see all you need to know. All right, and my favorite multicolored card, I had to choose one of my commanders. Um, and I was, I was torn between two commanders, but I'll just list one here, and I'll list the other one when we talk about our commanders. Uh, so my favorite multicolored card is Brutaclad, Telcor Engineer. 
He's a legendary artifact creature artificer for four, a blue and a red. He's a four, four. Creature tokens you control have haste at the beginning of combat on your turn. Create a two, one blue mirror artifact creature token. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. When I first saw this card, uh, I was I was in love with the effect. I immediately when as soon as I got the Sahili deck, I just switched it immediately over to a Brutaclad deck because uh, because I wanted to use that effect as much as possible. And and that's really what I love about the card is is making all of your tokens something uh, and cheating creatures into play as tokens and then making everything that creature because. Why not? There was one game where I, I, I stole a Grave Titan from Caleb with a Mimic Vat and then made a token of it and then I had 10 Grave Titans and uh, that's enough reason to put Brutaclad as my mo favorite multicolor card. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to our favorite artifacts. My favorite artifact is on the same line of the spell slinging, and it's Primal Amulet. For four mana, it's an artifact that says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you put a charge counter on Primal Amulet. Then if there are four or more charge counters on it, you may remove those counters and transform it. And it transforms into Primal Wellspring, which is a land that says, Tap to add one mana of any color to your mana pool, and when that mana is spent to cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. So, this is a super cool card, giving a reduction to all of your instants and sorceries is a dream in the spell slinging strategy. And in a lot of spell slinging strategies, you don't have access to green, so you take all the mana ramp you can get, even in the form of reduction. And casting three instants of sorceries in a turn is super easy. However, if you don't want it to turn into Primal Wellspring for whatever reason and you'd rather keep that reduction, that may is super important because you don't actually have to flip it over. You can just keep the spell reduction until you decide that you want to start copying your big spells. So that's my favorite card in Artifacts. My favorite artifact is Sword of Feast and Famine. For three, you get an artifact equipment and it equips for two. And it says, equip creature gets plus two plus two and has protection from the two best colors in EDH, black and green. So you're almost always going to be able to equip this to a creature and sneak it past somebody when you're playing EDH. And then when you do sneak it past one of your opponents, it says whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card and you untap all lands you control. The great thing about Sword of Feast and Famine is that very last part where you get to untap all of the lands that you control if you hit a player. Um, as you can tell, I really like this kind of play as I talked about treachery earlier. Um, putting this in a deck like Joda where I can drop something for just five mana like an Eldrazi and then swing in with another creature, untap all of my lands and keep that held up during all of my opponent's turns is just absolutely ridiculous. People hate this card. There are groans all around the table every single time I play this card, which is why I love this card. My favorite artifact card is gonna be Skull Clamp. It is one mana for an artifact equipment. For one generic, you can equip it to a creature. The equipped creature gets plus one, minus one, and when the equipped creature dies, draw two cards. So good. It really is just incredibly good. Anytime, especially in a deck where you're creating any kind of tokens, if they're one ones that you can just equip them and for one, have them die and draw two cards, an amazing rate and just will keep your hand full and keep your plays going. And even in a deck that doesn't have tokens, just in attaching it to one of your own creatures and having it die, you probably won't feel bad because you're getting to draw two cards off of it and you won't lose the equipment. So love Skull Clamp. My favorite artifact is also an equipment, Helm of the Host. Uh, it's a legendary artifact equipment for four. You can equip it for five and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except the token isn't legendary if the equipped creature is legendary. That token gains haste. I have never actually cast Helm of the Host. <laughs> what? Yeah. Don't admit that. I know, I know. Uh, I put it in decks. It's never happened, <laughs> but I really want to. I've I've thought a lot about what you could possibly do with a card like this. What kind of legendary creature you could you? you know, which commander would can you break with with the helm of the host attached to it? Garrett, Godo, Pandora. So many. 
so Watts many of them. is the answer. Yeah. And I'm it's really fun. I really like Helm of the Host. I think it's a very unique and fun equipment to have. He only plays it in decks with creatures that have heads that it could actually go on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, next up, we're going to be going over our favorite lands. And my favorite land is very simple. I only like it because I think the art is absolutely beautiful. And it's Sea of Clouds. It is from a cycle from Battle Bond. And I hope that they finish the cycle and give this type of ability to the remaining two color pairings. But Sea of Clouds says if enters the battlefield untapped if you have two or more opponents. As simple as that. And it taps for a white or a blue. And the art is amazing. It's super pretty. And I just, I like that card a lot. My favorite land is Maze of Ith. It doesn't tap for mana, but when you do tap it, it says untap target attacking creature, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and dealt by that creature this turn. Just a little bit of a pillow fort effect. Um, I really like playing this in decks like my Jaya deck that has a ton of those types of effects. It drives people crazy. Uh, it makes them not want to attack you even with their entire army because just, just having one of their creatures getting untapped is not efficient for them. So they'd much rather swing at somebody else. It's insane how often Maze of Ith can just draw so much hate and so many big creatures away from you just for being on the field. It is an awesome land. My favorite land is Crypt of Agadim. It's a land that enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap it to add a black to your mana pool. And for two and tap, add black to your mana pool for each black creature card in your graveyard. Now this is a, a, a really interesting land from Zendikar. And I didn't actually know about this line until I was building Sir Conrad, the Grim. And this card is crazy good. It almost feels like a Cabal Coffers with Urborg, Tomb of Yagmuth. I've been able to put 15 creatures into my graveyard and use Crypt of Agadim to get 15 mana. That's nuts. And I just, it makes me so happy using this card. So if you don't have one of these in your black decks, I would definitely recommend getting one. My favorite land is also uh black land it is bajuka bog uh enters the battlefield tapped when it enters the battlefield exile all cards from target players graveyard and it taps for a black i always think it's so funny to cast this card it feels bad when i draw it in my opening hand because i'm just holding on to it and hoping but um but there are so many times where i played this down it's just like wrecked someone's entire game and that just feels really good you know, watching that gameplay again, mm -hmm. when you Bajuka Bog lands graveyard to kill my sewer nemesis, uh -huh. I'm actually really offended about that. You really? That was such a good play. <laughs> it was. I congratulated it very you well. Two for one. You got, yeah. You got yeah. Two for the so game. good. Because I, I was like, ha, landed, and I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, die. Well, well played, sir. <laughs> All right, now on to our favorite commanders. We'll try and keep this brief, but my favorite commander is Kess Dissident Mage. This is the third card in the row, third card in a row that has to do with spell slinging, but that is my favorite strategy. So Kess Dissident Mage is a human wizard that costs one blue, black, red. She has flying and she says during each of your turns, you may cast an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. If a card cast this way would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. I love casting a demonic tutor from my hand and then a demonic tutor from my graveyard. And that's all I have to say about that. All right, my favorite commander is one that I've talked about on this podcast already. It is Mael the Anima for one red, one green, and one white. She's a 2-3 elf shaman with an ability that says pay three generic, one red, one green, and one white, and then tap her. You look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a creature card with power five or greater from among them into play. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So Mael was the very first commander that I ever built. And I am a Timmy at heart. And I absolutely love, if you can't tell already by the cards that I've already talked about, I absolutely love cheating stuff into play and swinging in with big, huge creatures. That's, that's how I play magic. So... Uh, Mael is also probably the best commander that I have for Helm of the Host because in her art, there's only a head and then flowers. So that's why she's my favorite. Mind blown. So my favorite commander is all centered around my desire to find the weirdest and oddest strategies. And no strategy is more odd than Yannette, Cryptic Sovereign. Do you like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smooth. Get it? <laughs> for two white, blue, black, 
Yannette is a 3-5 legendary creature sphinx with flying, vigilance, and menace. Whenever Yannette Cryptic Sovereign attacks, reveal the top card of your library. If that card's converted mana cost is odd, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, draw a card. So now you can see why this is the oddest deck. And just the... Two, two reasons. Number one, we have never seen this kind of effect on a commander, and we probably will never see this kind of effect on a commander, and I love that. I love things that are different and new, and you can pull this out and people are like, whoa, like, that's weird. I've never seen that. And the second reason is because she's Esper, and I love Esper. Not to mention that the art is really pretty. But yeah, Yannette, super amazing commander, and definitely the funnest that I've played. My favorite commander is Tesa Karlov. Uh, two, a white and black legendary creature, human advisor, 2-4. If a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Creature tokens you control have vigilance and lifelink. I, th I think I latch so strongly onto this commander because one, it's a very good effect. Doubling death triggers is something that we don't see very often at all and um and there's a whole strategy built around her that has support and there's there's a lot of different ways that you could go with this um the other reason is just the way that i ended up building her was a comp competition between us uh in when a ravnica allegiance came out we challenged ourselves to build one of the ravnica commanders uh, and face ourselves in a tournament, and I love the memory of that. A lot of funny memories from that day. Yeah, and I've I've day. I've kept that taste of Karlov almost the same, and it's competed well at a lot of commander games, and so I I I really enjoy playing this deck. All right, as the bonus lightning round, we're going to talk about the favorite art, and this is going to be a sub McKinnon tribute. <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> So, my favorite art on a Magic the Gathering card is Allure of the Unknown. For those listening on iTunes and Spotify, you're just going to have to close your eyes and just imagine the, the majesty of these cards we're going to talk about. You can look them up later. So, Allure of the Unknown. <laughs> I don't like this card for the ability. I might put it in a deck, but it costs three of black and red for a sorcery. It says, reveal the top six cards of your library. An opponent exiles a non card from among them. Then you put the rest into your hand. That opponent may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So it's super risky. Your opponent is probably going to pick the best card of the bunch to cast. You are still left with some cards to cast, but the art on this is so beautiful. Just for those listening on iTunes and Spotify, just imagine really hard. For those that are witnessing it on YouTube, you're welcome. Also, this was done by Seb McKinnon. Like I said, this is going to be a Seb McKinnon tribute. So, uh, mine's not by Seb McKinnon. But my favorite art on a magic card is Time Reversal. And it was painted by Howard Lyon. And it costs three and two blue for a sorcery that says, Each player shuffles his or her hand and graveyard into his or her library, then draws seven cards, exile Time Reversal. So, again, sorry for those that are listening on Spotify and iTunes. This art is super dope. It's got a guy some super powerful mage running up this windy staircase that reminds me of Led Zeppelin and Stairway to Heaven. Mm. And then he's got all these planets and this universe looking, all the, all these stars rotating around him. It's super dope art. And then the flavor text says, any oaf can conquer a kingdom. It takes true power to conquer time. And I think that Howard Lyon did that perfectly in this art. So my favorite art is actually going to be two cards again. And there, there's a reason for that. It is Growth Spiral and then Death Sprout. When Growth Spiral first came out uh, during Guilds of Ravnica, the art definitely blew me away. They're both by Seb McKinnon, by the way. Just shout out to Seb McKinnon. Again, Seb McKinnon tribute. But Growth Spiral was so gorgeous to me that it, it was up there at one of my favorite arts. And then when we hit Ravnica Allegiance and Death Sprout came out, it just blew me away. Putting both of these cards together and seeing this miniature story with just incredible art that almost just moves me. It, 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 it like gives me feelings and, and I, I love it when art does that. I love it when cards do that. So, But these two cards will remain my favorite art for a long time. I feel like I shouldn't even read mine because that was so moving. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have it's to. It's a hard act to follow. I'll just say it. Anyways, my favorite art is on uh, the new Modern Horizons card, Winds of Abandon. Uh, not only is it a, a pretty good overload card, um, I, I just like it. I, I'm not, I, I'm no art critic. It's got cherry blossoms and, uh, people exploding. 
<laughs> so, Those are uh, two good combos. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good combo. It's a very morbid yet peaceful card. Yes, <laughs> it's very nice. Maybe that's why I like it. Maybe that's why it's my favorite board wipe, but... Peter is both morbid and peaceful. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was it. Thanks for <laughs> keeping on this that, long that was, spiel. That was, that was it. That we was... Uh, hope you guys had as much fun as we did. <laughs> Yeah, we had. It was time. all like uphill until <laughs> until the favorite art, and it was just like <laughs> ninety degree. Like, <laughs> but thanks so much for listening. Um, in the comments, let us know your favorite cards. You can include all of the ones that we had too, if you just want to do your favorite blue card or maybe just your favorite art. Please let us know. We love reading our comments. Make sure if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe to the channel. It's a quick and easy way to help us out, and really appreciate it. Make sure to like this video. And check out our other podcast videos, deck techs, and gameplays on our channel. And with that, thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe. Wait, this sucks for the podcast listeners. <laughs> can we just like cut this? We, we can just cut it out for the podcast. It. <laughs> just imagine We all try and describe. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's got a woman is flying. A woman is now picture this. There is red and some black and some hands. And it's really pretty. And I then, promise. Well, content, not, take, right here. Please like. Maybe we should. There is a it. little boy um who has these black hands. His head <laughs> is exploding <laughs> backwards. <laughs> They're trying to grab him, and he's looking inside of a box. I promise it's pretty. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs>